All right, this is Chaplain Bob Walker, Light of the World Ministries. John, in John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Uh, the I just did the gift of God, and now we're going to look at spiritual gifts. I think we should open up with Romans chapter 1 starting in verse 8. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all. Didn't know Paul was a Southerner, did you? For you all, that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers. Make a request, if by any means now at length, I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come to you. For I long to see you, that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift. For I long to see you, that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift, to the end ye may be established." That is, that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. Now, I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes I purpose to come unto you, but was let hitherto, that I might have some fruit among you also, even as among other Gentiles. I am debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise." In Romans chapter 2 and verse 4, well, let's take a look. Uh, I guess we should read the Romans 2, starting 1. Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest. For wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that Judges does the same things. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness, and forbearance, and long suffering? not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. Did you know it's the goodness of God leads people to repentance? Did you know that? It does. Huh. Verse 5. But after thy hardness and impenitent heart trudges up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds. And that is scary, people. Uh, let's see. To them who by patient continuance in well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. But unto them that are contentious, and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, wrath, tribulation, and uh, anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil, of the Jew first, of the Jew first, and also of the Gentile. All right, let's go take a look at... First, uh, First Corinthians. All right, First Corinthians, chapter twelve. Now we're going to talk about spiritual gifts. Well, let's check something else out first. In the book of Hebrews, chapter eleven and verse one. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. 
Faith is a substance? Huh. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for. Hope for what? Eternal life. The evidence of things not seen. You can't see eternal life. Right? So, faith is a substance of things hoped for. So, all right, let's go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1. Now, concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. Ye know that ye were Gentiles carried away unto these dumb idols, even as ye were led. Now, Corinth was a city in Greece. Verse 3, Wherefore I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed, and that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord but by the Holy Ghost. Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. And what does diverse mean? It means different. Uh, you know, they're always pushing diversity for uh, for the white nations. Well, yeah. Yeah, we got to have everybody in white nations. That's We got to have diversity. That's what they tell us. But they're not talking about diversity of people here. They're talking about diversities of gifts, different types of gifts but the same Spirit. There are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. Now, you know, when you go to a school, you got a principal, and then you got a teacher, you know, teacher's in charge of the classroom, principal's in charge of the school, uh, you know, different administrations, but, you know, they have, it's just different levels. And there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith. By the same Spirit. Do you know what's... Didn't we just read that faith is the substance of things hoped for? Things not seen? You know, we have faith because of the Spirit. To another faith by the same Spirit. To another the gifts of healing by the same Spirit. To another the working of miracles to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another divers kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But all these worketh that one and the selfsame spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. Now remember, you have ten fingers, you have ten toes, you got a foot, you got a leg, you got arms, you got eyes, ears, a mouth. They're all part of one body, but they all have different functions. You know, you want to walk on the ground with your legs and feet. I mean, trying to walk on the ground with your hands and legs, I mean, your hands and um, arms would it'd get tiring after a while, you know? Or uh, if you tried to hear with your eyes, I, I, don't, I don't know if that would work very well. What do you think? You know, there's different, different administrations, different gifts. For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. But by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, 
whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have all and have been all made to drink into one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot shall say, Because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear shall say, Because I am not the eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? But now hath God set the members, every one of them, in the body, as it hath pleased him. And if they were all one member, where were the body? But now are they many members, yet but one body. And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Nay, much more those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. And these members of the body, which we think to be less honorable, upon these we bestow more abundant honor, and our uncomely parts have, have more abundant comeliness. For our comely parts have no need, but God hath tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that part which lacked, that there should be no schism, that's division, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. And whether one member suffers, suffer, all the members suffer with it. Or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now ye are the body of Christ, and members in particular. And God hath set some in the church. First apostles. You know, <laughs> Uh, the uh, if you looked at the gifts of God video I did, the foundation of the New Jerusalem is going to be the apostles. First apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers. And that's what I think my gift is, teacher. I'm not an apostle, not a prophet, teacher. So I'm somewhere in the middle, I guess. After that, miracles. Then gifts of healing, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? Have all the gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? But covet earnestly the best gifts. And yet show I unto you a more excellent way. Did you know that tongues was at the back end of the list? And what a and what do Pentecostals want? Oh, I want to speak in tongues. Blah 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 blah. Boy, I've been to those churches. I mean, I, I usually admit they're pretty lively, but I mean, I I don't know about you, but I'd rather have the gift of healing and and go hit a children's hospital and clean it out. But uh, you know, the uh, kosher doctors would probably have me killed for putting them out of business. You know, they'd, they'd, they'd be upset having to drive a Ford instead of a Mercedes, you know. But what can I tell you? All right, let's go to chapter 14. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 1. Follow after charity. Now, that's an interesting word uh, in the Greek. That's charity. Sometimes the King James translators use the word charity. Other times they translated it as love. Now, let me tell you something, people. If you've got love, you're going to have charity. And if you have charity, you have love. I mean, you know, you see somebody out in the cold and they don't have any warm clothing and you give them some warm clothes, uh, you do that out of love. Follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that ye may prophesy. prophesy. For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. For no man understandeth him, howbeit in the spirit he speaketh mysteries. But he that prophesieth 
speaketh unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself, but he that prophesieth edifieth the church. I would that ye all spake with tongues, but rather ye prophesied. For greater is he that prophesieth than he that speaketh with tongues, except he interpret that he that the church may receive edifying. Now, brethren, if I come unto you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you, except I shall speak to you either by revelation or by knowledge or by prophesying or by doctrine? Yeah, what good is speaking in gibberish that nobody can understand? What good is that? I mean, I'm not saying it's all gibberish. I mean, uh, let's say somebody comes in and they're speaking French to me. Well, guess what? I flunked French in high school. That's a joke. I never took French in high school. I took German. But I'm just saying, you know, somebody who speaks French, uh, yeah, if you lived up in Quebec, Canada, yeah, well, great. But uh, suppose somebody's speaking Russian. Do you know Russian? How about Chinese? Japanese? No. What, what good is it? You don't understand it. What good is it in a church if somebody's up at the pulpit speaking in Japanese? It's useless, right? Now, brethren, if I come unto you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you except I speak to you either by revelation or by knowledge or by prophesying or by doctrine? And even things without life giving sound, whether pipe or harp, except they give a distinction in the sounds, how shall it be known what is piped or harped? For if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to the battle? Now, remember, uh, if those of you that you know watch maybe an old Western movie, uh, how they used to have the bugle calls, and that was the call for, you know, prepare for battle, charge. Well, if it just went, nobody would know what that meant. I'm Sorry, I don't have a bugle, so I, you know. But for if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to the battle? You know, nobody will know what to do. So likewise ye, except ye utter by the tongue words easy to be understood, how shall it be known what is spoken? For ye shall speak into the air. It's like talking to the wall, right? There are, it may be, so many kinds of voices in the world, and none of them is without sig signification. Therefore, if I know not the meaning of the voice, I shall be unto it that speaketh a barbarian, and he that speaketh shall be a barbarian unto me. Even so ye, forasmuch as ye are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek that ye may excel to the edifying of the church. Wherefore, let him that speaketh in an unknown tongue pray that he may interpret. For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. What is it then? I will pray with the Spirit, and I will pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the Spirit, and I will sing with the understanding also. Else when thou shalt bless with the Spirit, how shall he that occupieth the room of the unlearned say amen at thy giving of thanks? Seeing he understandeth not what thou sayest. You know, if somebody's speaking gibberish, I mean, they could be possessed of a devil, a demon, and be cursing God in an unknown language to you. Uh, maybe they're cursing God in Russian or whatever, any other language, and you're going to say amen? I don't, I wouldn't. I, I wouldn't trust it. Okay, so, verse 17. For thou verily givest thanks well, but the other is not edified. I thank my God I speak with tongues more than ye all. Uh, by the way, Paul was a Roman citizen, so I'll guarantee you he knew Latin. Here it is, he's preaching to the Greeks in, Cor in Corinth. I'll guarantee he knew 
Greek. And being that he was a Pharisee of the tribe of Benjamin, and he was trained by Gamaliel, a learned, what some would call a rabbi, I'll guarantee you he knew Hebrew. So he knew Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. And what were the three languages on the cross that uh, when they hung Jesus on the cross that uh, Pilate wrote, this is Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews? Latin, Greek, Hebrew. Oh, yeah. I thank my God I speak with tongues more than ye all. Yet in the church, I had rather speak five words with understanding with my understanding that by my voice I might teach others than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. Brethren, be not children in understanding, howbeit malice be ye children, but in understanding be men. In the law it is written, with men of other tongues and other lips will I speak unto this people. Now that's a prophecy from the Old Testament. And that's what they did. Remember in the day of Pentecost, the apostles went out and they spoke to everybody in the book of Acts and in, in their languages and they understood what they were saying and they were preaching the gospel of Jesus. Maybe we should take a look at that. All right, let's take a look real quick at Acts chapter 2, verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, all the apostles and, you know, probably a bunch of uh, believers. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of a fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit, as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. Now, these were the believing Jews, I guess, you know, devout men. These were not the um, Talmudic Zionists. These were Bible-believing, Torah-keeping Jews, probably all believers in Christ. So, verse 6. Now, when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. So here it is, they're preaching the gospel, and everybody's hearing them speak their own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and the dwellers in Mesopotamia and in Judea and Cappadocia in Pontus and Asia. Uh, P-H-R-Y-G-I-A and Pamphylia in Egypt and the parts of Libya about Cyrene and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians. We do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. And they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, What meaneth this? In other words, what's the meaning of this? Others mocking said, These men are full of new wine. They're a bunch of drunks, right? But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken, as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. Uh, and then, you know, Joel's one of the minor prophets. It's in the Old Testament. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. So your daughters, your sons and daughters are going to prophesy. Young men shall see visions, and I guess I'm going to have dreams, the old, the old guys, right? 
And on my servants and on my handmaids I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. Didn't the, um, uh, this is, when you take a look at this and Joel and the book of Exodus where God set, turned the water to blood under Pharaoh and then you read the book of Revelation where God turns the water to blood I mean, and fire. Remember in uh, Egypt, the hail that was mingled with fire? And then there's going to be same thing in Revelation. Well, I don't know about hail, but there's going to be some fire. There's going to be some burning. And vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness. Jesus warned about this in Matthew 24. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken, and by wicked hands, wicked hands, have crucified and slain, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. For David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always, before my face, for he is on my right hand, that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. Moreover also my flesh shall rest in hope, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine Holy One to see corruption. You know, people, Christ went to hell for three days and three nights. I did a Bible study on it, if you're interested. Um... And what was he doing? Well, guess what? Read Abraham's bosom. It's in the book of Luke. Uh, look it up. I don't want to get into it. You know, I, I mean, each one of these Bible studies is an hour. Uh, but Jesus, when he died, he went to hell to Abraham's bosom, not the flaming part, Abraham's bosom, where all the Old Testament saints went. And he preached to them the gospel, and they believed and were raised up out of that to go to, um, I guess there are soul and spirits in heaven right now, waiting for the resurrection of their bodies to come but return to earth and uh, look out when they return. Uh, you know, a, a lot of people, I, I try to get into some deep Bible stuff, I mean, that's what I try to do. And I try to keep it, you know, an hour or less. I try. I don't always succeed, but I try. Because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. And let's face it, people, there was no Savior in the Old Testament. Where do you think the Old Testament saints went? They went to hell. There's three different words that they use for hell. The grave... Gehenna, which is flames of fire, and um, then Tartarus, which is the uh, abode of the fallen angels who are shackled unto the day of judgment. And that's in the book of Jude, if you're interested. And uh, the Jehovah's false witnesses will take the first meaning. Oh, they're in the grave. They're in the grave. That's what hell is. And then they'll totally deny that there's fire. Well, tell that to the rich man. And the, rich, the story that Jesus told of the rich man and Lazarus. Lazarus was in Abraham's bosom, and the rich man was complaining he was in the flames. Well, what can you tell? What can I tell you? Because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. Men and brethren, let me speak 
uh, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God hath sworn with an oath to him, that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we are all witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this, that ye now see and hear. For David is not ascended into the heavens, but he saith himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand, until I make thy foes thy footstool. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made this, that same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts, and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent. Now these are people that believe, believe in God but not necessarily believed in Jesus. Peter said unto them, Repent. Repent of what? Their unbelief? I don't think so. I think he was telling them to repent of the wickedness. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. That's what they're repenting of, their sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the, promises, for the promises unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, people. Verse 40. And with many other words he did, did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized in the same day, there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear, and fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things common. And sold their possessions of good and parted them to all men as every man had need. Now that, is true communism. And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Huh. All right, let's go back to 1 Corinthians 14. Uh, verse 22, wherefore tongues are for a sign, not to them. Oh, wait a minute. Maybe I should go back. Yeah, we'll go. We'll do 20. Brethren, be not children in understanding. Howbeit in malice be ye children, but in understanding be men. In the law it is written, with men of other tongues and other lips will I speak unto this people, and yet for all that they will not hear me, saith the Lord. Wherefore, tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. See, God's showing them a miracle to the unbelievers to prove that Jesus was the only begotten Son, that Jesus was the Lamb of God, and Teach them the gospel. Wherefore, tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. But prophesying serveth not for them that believeth not, but for them which believe. See, tongues are for unbelievers, and prophesying is for the believers. If therefore the whole church be come together into one place, and all speak with tongues, and there come in 
those that are unlearned or unbelievers, will they not say that ye are mad? And that's that's a Pentecostal church, if you ask me, people. Most of them are, ugh, I, it makes me weird, you know. Especially, uh, I remember, I used to believe when I was a young teen, I was in middle school, I think I was in ninth grade. Ninth, yeah, ninth grade. And mom and I and my sister went to a Pentecostal church and they had snakes. You know, the ones with the triangular heads, with the slit slit, slit eyes. Yeah, uh, those are poisonous snakes. They were playing with snakes, people. We walked in the door, took a look around, saw that, looked at each other, and kind of decided we're on the wrong place. And uh, I don't know if any of you remember, uh, was it Snaggletooth or Snagglepuss? Where it said, all right already, exit, stage left. And that's what we did. We made a an exit, stage left. We got out of there, people. Woof. So, verse 24. But if all prophesy, and there come in one that believeth not, or one is the learned, he is convinced of all, he is judged of all. And thus are the secrets of his heart made manifest, and so falling down on his face, he will, he will worship God and report that God is in you of a truth. How is it then, brethren, when ye come together, every one of you hath a psalm, hath a doctrine, hath a tongue, hath a revelation, hath an interpretation? Let all things be done unto edifying. Now, almost no Pentecostal church that I know of does this. Verse 27. If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two or at the most by three, and that by course. In other words, let one speak, another speak, and then when he's done, then the next one speak, and then when he's done, the next one speak. Two or three at the most, okay? And that by course, and let one interpret. There has to be an interpreter. But if there be no interpreter... Let him keep silence in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. How many Pentecostal churches follow this? Only two or three people speak in tongues and there has to be an interpreter saying what these people are, you know, saying. I've never seen a Pentecostal church do that. And, and I'm not just picking on Pentecostals, okay? I pick on the Baptists too, big time. I went to one of their Bible colleges. I know all their dirty secrets. Well, a lot of them. Maybe not all of them. Uh, verse 29. Let the prophet speak two or three, and let the other judge. If anything be revealed to another that sitteth by, let the first hold his peace. For ye may all prophesy one by one, that all may learn, and all may be comforted. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets, for God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And that doesn't mean uh, women absolutely, positively should teach the children, you know. But I, I think what he's talking about here is, you know, don't uh, don't have Jezebel. Uh, you read about Jezebel. I think it's in Revelation chapter 2 or maybe number 3. Uh, she was leading the church, seducing everybody, uh, having the men sleep with her. She was seducing them physically and spiritually. And just remember something, people. It was Eve that was deceived in the garden, not Adam. Although he's he was just as guilty. Uh, you know, but uh, Timothy was taught by his mother and grandmother. Remember that. And Timothy was a young pastor. Paul taught Timothy some things, but I'll guarantee his mother and grandmother taught him more than Paul did. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. But... Uh, 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 Paul didn't want women leading the church. Okay, that's what that's what he means here. 
And that women absolutely have a very important ministry. Look at Deborah in the Old Testament. She was a prophetess and a judge. She was the leader. Matter of fact, when the uh, general of the army was supposed to go out and fight, uh, he wouldn't go without her. He says, well, if you go with me, I'll go out and fight. But if you won't go with me, I'm not leaving. He, I guess he wanted her to hold his hand in the battle. Now, and let me tell you something, people. I'll take a woman speaking the truth over a man who's a liar any day. Uh, can you say Gail Ripplinger and James White? What can I tell you? Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. What? Came the word of God out from you, or came it unto you only? If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. But if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. What does ignorant mean? Ignorant means you don't know something. doesn't mean you're stupid. It just means that you lack knowledge. When it comes to brain surgery, I am ignorant, people. Rocket science, ignorant, people. Uh, physics and calculus, I'm ignorant, people. When it comes to the Bible, I'm not. Wherefore, brethren, covet to prophesy. What does it mean to covet? It means want something bad. Wherefore, brethren, covet to prophesy and forbid not to speak with tongues. Let all things be done e decently and in order. All right, well, that concludes uh, spiritual gifts. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor to the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. And that's Jesus, who is the Christ in his precious name. Amen.